Greetings. So we have found a nice spot in the warmth with some some good old Swedish coffee. So uh, anyway, we have a lot of things to talk about. First and foremost, Tom, you have uh, released a, a book, a very nice one. I shared it on my Instagram. It looks like this. Boom. And in it, I saw a um, character that is somewhat familiar to me, and this is the Green Knight. And the first time I actually heard about the Green Knight was from Warhammer. And oh, so it's a Warhammer fantasy. Oh, right, and yeah. So there is a um, faction called Bretonnia, which are based upon medieval France plus Arthurian legend. And one of these characters are is the Green Knight and I obviously got hooked immediately. I was only 14 at the time and I thought that was a really really epic sort of thing. But um, I thought you could elaborate a bit on to my dear subscribers who the Green Knight is. And also first, um, I'm sorry, I just have to... Uh, I didn't really give an introduction to Survive the Dive. So if anyone isn't aware of Tom, I will link his channel below and I definitely do suggest that you subscribe, watch all of his videos. I watched all of his videos and I've gained uh, a good a bit of uh, enlightenment and knowledge from them and I would say that's probably my very favorite channel and I'm not just saying that because he's my mate but uh, because it's um, it's a good channel. So um, check them out. Yeah, so it's, anyway. mostly, it's mostly uh, pagan religion, Germanic history, uh, DNA and science, like about population genetics, um, and sort of traditionalism and spirituality. That's what my channel's about. Yeah. yeah so if you um, if you like um, René Gunon, Julius Evola, if you like if you like um, history in general, spirituality, definitely check out all of his videos. Um, it will be a good thing you can do now over um, over Christmas and Jule time. So anyway, back to the to the topic of the Green Knight. Yeah. Who um, give us give us the well, the, the, the book that you mentioned is it's got a cartoon you can see as well. It's called The Spirit of Yule, and the reason I wrote the Green Knight into it because the Green Knight didn't exist in pagan times and the, the story is about a Christian guy from Victorian times going back into pagan times so the, Chris, the Green Knight's from the time in between early Christian uh, ideas but the reason I included him is because he's in a specific Arthurian story about Christmas so he was a quite an early Christmas figure you could say uh, in that sense and he's very popular in in like in that sense he's a very mystical figure um, the design of the character that we did, or rather Christopher, the artist did, is based partly on something called the Green Man, which is a, is a different thing. But that's like a, a church masonry uh, motif in, in England, where they, in the medieval times, they carved this figure whose face was made of leaves and stuff. And no one really knows why they had that on these churches, but a lot of people want to say that it has a pagan origin. But there's no uh, record of any pagan gods that had faces made of leaves anyway. But maybe it does, but it certainly doesn't correspond to anything in the Bible. So it's quite mysterious. And anyway, we decided to merge the Green Knight and the Green Man because they're similar and from the same times and the kind of mystical figures. But the Green Knight, this is the story, it's from a, a, a story called Sagawain and the Green Knight. And it's in Middle English. So in Middle English, it would be uh, the Greena Knicht. Uh, which okay if you don't you might imagine you can speak Middle English but I if you haven't had any practice with it it's going to be hard so you would read the translation otherwise and there's some great readings online and there's even a cartoon that you can watch online that some I think the BBC made a long time ago uh, and that's really cool to watch even if it's in Middle English because you get the picture from the cartoon so I'll, I'll try and summarize the story King Arthur and his knights it's Christmas they're setting around sat around the round table in Camelot feasting and enjoying themselves drinking and what not and then boom the doors open and a, a, a massive green knight with green armor green face everything green riding a green horse just rides right into the court which is not what you do you don't ride horses into court and um, challenges everyone there telling them that they're not real Christians that they don't follow they're not doing Christmas right and uh, that they're all bad and um, insults him basically and uh, challenges them insulting their honor in the process saying who will who will accept my challenge and uh, only of all the knights only Sir Gawain, the virtuous but young and somewhat uh, naive knight um, he rises to the challenge and says he will take the green knight's challenge and that is that um, 
he will the, the green knight has an axe and he says uh, you will um, you will strike my head with the axe and then I will strike off yours and then so so Gawain uh, does that chops off the green knight's head but that does the green knight picks up his own head he's still alive and then he says okay now next year this day on Christmas I'm gonna do the same to you and then um, basically the the whole, the whole story then is about what uh, Gawain is doing to try and avoid uh, <laughs> the inevitable fate the next Christmas and to summarize it and ruin it a bit for you this story is a Christian morality tale it's about like um, Gawain learning like virtue of sacrifice and and stuff like that and um, the short story is he passes the test and uh, the Green Knight is really on the side of the court and he's mm -hmm. working for King Arthur and it's all a, a, a game to show but the Green Knight is an interesting figure because green is just as kind of is now was associated with paganism mm -hmm. and evil not not now we don't think green is an evil color but green because of its association with paganism in Christian Europe did have an evil and magical s aspect uh, and um, that is why even though the Green Knight didn't exist in pagan Europe we often like to see him as kind of like a pagan figure and representing somehow paganism although he's a deliverer he's a, actually testing them according to Christian values yeah I always associated him more with um, a, a force of nature and yeah. obviously I as always associate pagan things more with nature and more human things more with Christianity but obviously the uh, the intermarriage between uh, Christianity and, uh, and paganism always um, in Europe looks a bit different than it does in in the Bible so yeah I suppose mm. he the mythic character of the Green Knight is um, is not something you would find in, in the Bible exactly. no no it's very European it's very British. very Indo-European very Indo-European maybe I said no. it. yeah yeah <laughs> it's it's very British French whatever Welsh it probably I mean it's hard to say because obviously the Welsh want to claim Arthur as a as their own but many of these myths don't appear in not all of them appear in mm. in, way, in Welsh literature uh, Sagawain and the Green Knight is written in Middle English I mean there's some and um, Wolfram's Parsifal book is is German so I mean Arthurian myth and legend it, it may have originated the trend in uh, Celtic speaking uh, parts of Britain but it spread to France to Germany it was really it was like the Star Wars of its day if you um, I don't like I mean not everyone likes Star Wars now because of all the horrible uh, recent yeah I've actually never even seen it so yeah you're not missing uh, too much but yeah. anyway actually even the original Star Wars was based partially on Arthurian literature mm -hmm. so Arthurian themes are in the original Star Wars you have I don't want to go too much into Star Wars. <laughs> Obi Wan Kenobi is kind of like Merlin, you uh -huh. know. It's like right. the, the young, I mean, young Luke Skywalker is kind of like, like a Parsifal or Gawain or something. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, these are what was good in the original Star Wars is only the aspects that are good about it, the things that come from eternal, you know, myths. And that's the same with Arth Arthurian literature, although it typifies the Christian High Middle Ages, as uh, as Julius Evola has written in. Uh, his book uh, the mystery of the grail you can see that a lot of the themes were from older pagan sources but not they're not saying that they're pagan stories but they have parallels in earlier pagan stories yeah so I suppose uh, at least for me I've always been quite interested in the Arthurian legend I think it's very uh, mythic and epic and heroic tale and uh, since you talk a lot about I know you've made some videos and yet again you can check them out uh, but you just answer the question right here uh, some people have seen also in the film King Arthur from like I don't know, 10 years ago uh, they claim that King Arthur came from uh, the Sarmatians if I'm not mistaken uh, Okay, yeah. Have you seen the film? Uh, no, but I know about this. This um, oh, this, the, the theory. This theory is very yeah. old, very yeah. very old, and that's why it's popular. Mm -hmm. But it's not true. Mm. Uh, there actually were. I've done a, a talk recently uh, in America, and I uploaded it to uh, my SoundCloud about origin narratives and identity, and it explains that actually around the Middle Ages it was very popular all across Europe. People wanted to ascribe mythical origins to their people, to their races. So the French started to say that they were descended from the Trojans. The Welsh also said they were descended from the Trojans, but later also said they're simultaneously descended from Trojans and Jews somehow. <laughs> and uh, some of the Celts in British Isles decided they were descended from the Scythians. Now, what do the Trojans, the Jews? the Scythians have in common at that time in the Middle Ages people know about them 
that's the basic thing is when they switched to a Europeans Celts and Germans switched to a literate culture they lost a lot of their history of what where people came from yeah. but they had access to very old records of ancient civilizations Rome Greece the Trojan War the ancient Hebrews which they learn about through the Bible and the Scythians are mentioned by Romans and mm. the Hebrews so they're in the Bible so the Scythians are good and a suitable source to say where you come from. Mm -hmm. So that is why you find in these medieval texts people saying that. Why did uh, Snorri Sturluson say that the gods came from Troy? Why did the French say that they came from Troy? Why did the Celts start saying they were Syrian? Mm -hmm. Not because they were, because we can see from DNA that they weren't, but because uh, that was uh, prestigious. It's good for them to say that. And you should watch that talk if you want to hear more about that. Yeah, and also speak on this during the um, 1600s, I suppose it was. Uh, I might have the dates wrong here, but but uh, I know that the, the Swedish Empire or Kingdom then, they promoted quite heavily their Gothic past. And I know that other European nations also did that. So Spain, for example, yeah. harken back to the Visigothic path because that was a kind of prestige thing. We come mm. from these brave mm. uh, people who restructured Europe. So it is something that you see in, in, um, in different times as well, this uh, you know, claiming a past. But the, so. the difference is with that is that the Spain, Spain, the Visigoths were in Spain. Yeah, it's true. And, it's true in our case, And also the Goths do come from Scandinavia mm. originally. So the Swedes do have a connection to the Goths. Yeah. So that's slightly different. But what store of Gothicism, that um, trend in the 1600s in Sweden where they celebrated the Goths a lot, the, what was untrue about it is that they started to say that the Goths did certain things that the Goths never did. They kind of made up the idea that, that Uppsala was the center of the world's civilization. And, and, uh, yeah, I didn't actually oh, know yeah. about that. Oh, they <laughs> made up all kinds of crazy stuff. But that, this, I mean, that, yeah, the, the Goths weren't uh, the, the, the inventors. The, the Goths were the inventors of all the world's civilizations. We was inventors. Yeah, shit, man. we was Goths, basically. <laughs> but, uh, but, but they were, they, they were Goths, but the Goths weren't everything else. Yeah, of. but the an important thing here is that you can definitely see the importance of history like for identity and people like they yeah. need to have a strong sense of who they are mm -hmm. and this is obviously something I've talked about before that in order to if we're talking about the soullessness of the modern world in in the Western world a lot of that can probably stem from the fact that the the tree has been cut the roots have been cut yeah. we have no idea who we are we have no idea who our mm -hmm. ancestors were where we come from anything yeah so in my view if we want to revive Europe yeah rekindle Kindle the spirit of like who we are. Yeah, so I think that's what, what, what history is. Yeah. A large part of the history, and that in, it gets people interested in history, is to know who you are, where you come from, yeah. finding this stuff. Whether you're researching your ancestry or researching ancient kings, it's uh, it's uh, has a similar motive behind it. It reinforces your sense of self, grounds you in the process of time, yeah. because life is just the experience of time, of being within time. So history is a major part of that, and uh, it should help you to focus your sense of self and being yeah and this is also something uh, I've said before is that if you view Sweden for example in a historic context going back to the Gothic age and the Viking age and the mm. Carolian age um, if you view a certain nation or a civilization in that context you're more prone to actually care about what happens after you're dead mm. um, whereas if you only if you don't care you don't know that we were Goths or whatever um, yeah why would you care what happens in, in 20 years mm. so uh, getting a good view and understanding of history of myths and legends everything very important stuff and that's also yet again why I appreciate your channel because you delve into these myths so much and uh, especially like we talked a bit about the wild hunt just uh, the previous video um, getting that sense of epicness and heroicness into a self-improvement game uh, mm. very useful and yeah. Um, yeah yeah I think incorporating these myths and our history into our own rituals whether you're going to the gym or whatever you're doing it's important because it you know it it not, mustn't be history shouldn't be an us and them sensation there's, there's a constant chain leading us right back through time to our ancestors and forwards to our descendants and that's why where that's where our role is it is to pass on that flame to the next generation yeah, and in our case maybe rekindle it because yeah, uh, it's, it's a lot of dormant, going out a bit. <laughs> yeah, it, it does. In it needs a bit more fuel, I think. Yeah, it, it does indeed. So anyway, we uh, wish you a um, good jul and uh, merry Christmas from a snowy Sweden. Good jul.